I'm really glad you guys are here. Thank you for coming. And I couldn't be more delighted to tell this story to, to all of you here. And let me just say a, a few words of thanks. Um, I guess I better understand now why Tony was so gracious and accommodating my request to be gone for about seven weeks. Um, thank you, Tony, though, for, for uh, enabling me to, to do so. And, and thanks to Merle Hendershot, who functioned as the uh, acting department chair during my absence, uh, to Denise Darling and folks in the department office, to uh, the wonderful people in the Marine Biology Research Division who helped with some of the development um, associated with, with getting our, our gear out to sea, uh, especially James Pollock and Sam Chin, the wonderful group there. Um, and thanks to Rosa Leon uh, Zayas, my graduate student, who I unfortunately put too much work, work on. I need you to speak closer to that mic. The mic on your shirt isn't... Oh, it's just not going to work? Okay, I'll try and stay, stay close to the microphone. Um, okay, well, let's get into this. <coughs> Let's see if this is going to work. There we go. What a fantastic, surreal experience. It was a little bit Jules Verne and a little bit Jules Jaffe to, to be out there. <laughs> it felt a little like science fiction and, and, and tremendous technology. Uh, Tony just mentioned that the next chancellor is going to be an engineer. Um, I certainly couldn't have been prouder to have had the opportunity as a biologist to have interacted with the engineers associated with this expedition. They were phenomenal. <coughs> and of course, I want to pay tribute to, to James Cameron, the visionary, uh, the film producer that you know. But, but uh, in this audience, I think you also know he's the National Geographic Explorer someone who's worked in the deep sea for, for many, many years and has gone on many uh, sub-dives in the past. And it was his vision to bring the right group of engineers together who had this plan and worked very quietly over a number of years to develop this amazing green torpedo that could rocket down to great depth and, and come back to the surface. <laughs> I've said this before, and, and I'll say it again, that the steel that had to be put into that sphere uh, had nothing on the steel in, in, in Jim Cameron to be able to go into a, a sub uh, as yet untested by a, a, a another pilot and, and go to the, the fullest ocean depth really uh, takes confidence, it takes knowledge, and uh, it took a lot of guts. So here's the sub. Here's at least uh, some artists' renditions of the Deep Sea Challenger. And you can see it's a little bit like flip. Um, it operates in both a horizontal and a vertical fashion. And it, it goes down in, in this vertical format. You see over on the right some of the, the key characteristics of the sub, the large panel of, of LED lights, the boom for lights and for, for the camera one of the cameras, the lithium ion battery sections, uh, the iron weights at the bottom, the stabilizer fins. Much of the weight is taken up by this, the, this, the sphere, uh, the this, this steel uh, uh, cylinder. It's only 43 centimeters across inside, so the pilots, both Jim and Ron Allum, had to sit with their legs crossed for the duration of the dive. Uh, so a very small compartment inside. It was held by polyester straps to the, the, the uh, majority of the structure of the sub, which is this um, specially produced syntactic foam that actually increased in buoyancy with depth and provided a lot of the structure for the sub. So very, very novel engineering went into this. There's a view of, of Jim uh, in in the sphere, again, you can see very little, little room, instrumentation all around him for oxygen and CO2 scrubbing and uh, capturing the moisture, the condensation from, uh, from him, from him um, for the, the piloting controls, for the working of the manipulator arm, and, and so on. So very little room inside. This is uh, an example of the display that he could look at, look at. He could very easily see where he was at with regard to depth. It had a, an autopilot and an auto altitude feature to it. 
And of course, we can compare the Deep Sea Challenger with the Trieste, the bathyscaphe that went down 50 plus years ago. Deep Sea Challenger, much lighter, 12 metric tons. Uh, only a single pilot could go in versus two. It went down super fast, almost two meters per second, up um, less than four meters per second, but very, very rapid ascent. So it was just two hours down to the Challenger Deep, one hour back up. Uh, it would rotate a bit as it went up and, and, and down so it could hold on to position. Um, obviously, it had amazing uh, video capabilities uh, associated with it. The pilot didn't look through the porthole, which was down a little bit low, around knee level. Um, he looked through a, uh, an epic camera, one of those IMAX quality cameras to get the wide angle view that was so sharp, better than what you could see looking out a porthole. Um, Let's see, on the, on the starboard side, on the boom, there was a 3D camera, so two cameras in sync for the 3D effect. On the manipulator arm, there were also two cameras, one for wide angle viewing, one for macro viewing. Um, so lots of, of cameras, camera inside 3D filming inside of the pilot, so uh, pretty amazing, and plenty of bottom time. This is, this was, um, the support ship for the Deep Sea Challenger. This is a view of the ship um, prior to the cruise, so you don't see it filled up with the, the hangar for the submersible and, and all the containers that we were using and, and the various engineering teams were using there. Beautiful ship, holds 60 people, um, and we actually needed more than just room for 60 people during this expedition. Uh, here are some of the superstars associated with the expedition. This is down in the cafeteria, and you can see Jim speaking with members of the group. Um, I don't have a pointer. If, if by, by chance one of you has one, that would be useful. But um, the, the gentleman with the white hair with a pencil in his hand, that's Ron Allen. That's the other pilot for the submersible. Between Ron and Jim is um, uh, uh, Walt uh, Conti, uh, a key engineer. Across from him is a, another engineer, um, uh, David Goldie. Both of these people work in the film industry. Walt and, and, and colleagues run a, a business where they make animated uh, animatronics, animals for filming, for Free Willy and for Anaconda and, and so on. David Goldie has been involved in pyrotechnics. He's out of uh, Australia. And both of these people worked tirelessly late into the night to, thank you very much, um, to develop a, a sediment sampler, which was very instrumental. And I just kept thinking um, dur during all this, I, you know, I would never get this kind of amazing engineering uh, uh, assistance uh, um, in any other kind of expedition. It was wonderful to, to be able to interact a bit with Walt and David and other people. Here are some folks involved with acoustics out of, a, acoustic uh, communication out of Australia. Um, uh, they knew of, of some of the work being done here at Scripps by Mike Buckingham, uh, for example, so there was a bit of a, uh, an interest uh, by these folks in some of the work being, being done here. And I won't go through everybody that, that's there, but it was just a, a terrific group of people, very, very nice people to work with. Uh, and to have a, a, an opportunity to, to see in action. And then in addition to the work with the submersible, there were the lander operations. There were two landers deployed during the first phase of the expedition. Um, and you can see one of those uh, landers being, being deployed here. The landers had both a, a 5D camera inside a glass sphere to do still imaging as well as a 3D uh, video capability on an arm that after the lander dropped to the surface, it would drop this arm down with a, a baited sampler that would rest on the seafloor and the 3D uh, video could, could film all of that. So it had good uh, video and camera capabilities. It had um, a radio beacon and GPS and a few different kinds of acoustic communication and control, so uh, well set up for what we needed to do. Here is that same lander uh, in the water. Had lights, of course, as well, LED lights um, and batteries. Um, the, the ability to do the lander work was the result of Kevin Hardy. Kevin, longtime uh, senior developmental development engineer here at Scripps, 
and a uh, longtime friend of, uh, of Scripps ran um, our centennial celebration and has been on countless expeditions. It was really Kevin who worked up the design for the landers and their fabrication, much of that done here, um, some in the marine shop, some elsewhere here in San Diego. Um, but he used the lander commander who had the idea behind the, the landers and saw that through to fruition, worked in, in uh, Sydney uh, for several months helping to, to bring those to completion. Uh, and here on the Mermaid Sapphire, some other people who were associated with the work with the landers. Um, here's Robbie Seed. Um, he was responsible for much of the work with lander uh, operations along with Erica Montague, who isn't in the, the picture here, but also helped out a lot with the, the um, lander deployments early on. Um, and uh, Larry Herbst and Dave Mitchell helped with the camera operations associated with the landers. Tremendous group of people. Um, okay, so when starting out the, the expedition, we started out in Papua New Guinea off the island of New Britain. So here you see the island, island of New Britain. Australia would be uh, below the screen. Um, uh, we've got Philippines off to, to the northwest here and Japan to the north. Northern Mariana Islands here, Guam right here, Challenger Deep, would, and the, Chal the Mariana Trench uh, coming along here, okay? Um, and much of this is, is Micronesia. So we started out the expedition here, and we ended up the expedition in the, in the Challenger Deep and in the area of Guam. Um, this is a slide that gives you a little sense of the bathymetry of the, of the New Britain Trench. The New Britain Trench gets as deep as about 8.2 kilometers. Um, you can see highlighted areas where there are volcanoes and where there have been earthquakes. Obviously, subduction zones are intimately associated with these sorts of uh, events, volcanic eruptions and, and, and earthquakes. And uh, you certainly felt that when you were in New Britain. Um, we stayed uh, in the city of Rabaul. In 1994, there was a volcanic eruption there that destroyed much of the city. Uh, here you see a, a view of the, the volcano. Uh, Tverver, I think is the pronunciation of the volcano. You can see the mermaid sapphire out here in the, in the bay. Um, I'm pleased to report you can still get plenty of beetle nuts, as many as you'd like in the city, but much of the city was destroyed. Much of the ability for it to be a major harbor was destroyed in, in 1994. Again, that, that link to subduction processes and the formation of trenches. There was a, a second boat associated with the expedition, both in, uh, so, uh, um, uh, with the, the work in the New Britain Trench and then later on in the Mariana Trench. And in Papua New Guinea, it was the spirit of, of New Guinea dive boat that we worked off of. Um, the lab conditions were, were primitive. Here, here you can see we're just right on the, the back of a, what is really a scuba diving boat, but it was sufficient to get a, get a lot of work done and, and the crew on this ship were just fantastic. We uh, had to commute from the dive boat to the Mermaid Sapphire every morning and then back home late at night and so this is our, our uh, morning commute. Um, here's Peter Batson. Uh, he is a gentleman from New Zealand, a good marine biologist. He was someone involved with coordinating the science operations. So it was great to have him out at sea. Uh, here's Mark Thiessen, a photographer with the National Geographic Society. There are a lot of really great photographers and writers associated with the expedition, people that have written books about environmental causes. Mark has gone off and filmed methane hydrates in uh, in Arctic permafrost, and he's followed Russian firefighters in, 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 in Russia. He's just got amazing stories to tell. There are a lot of people like that that were a part of this expedition. So that was the, the morning commute. Um, oftentimes, uh, we would start out the day with a 7 a.m. meeting on the bridge, and so here you, you can see us uh, starting to get positioned for that meeting it gives me an opportunity to, to, to mention some of the other people uh, that were there, David Weatherspoon, who, who took care of all of the operations on the, on the stern of the, the vessel, the deployment recovery of the sub and the landers, and, and really looked over much of what, what happened. 
Uh, he's served, I think it's 14 tours of, uh, of duty in the, in the British military, uh, so an, an amazing person. Uh, this is John Bruno, film director, Academy Award winning film director for special effects uh, with Avatar. Um, Glenn Singelman was the physician on the cruise and, and also was one of the, the, the filmmakers. Like a lot of people on the cruise, people did double duty. Um, and Glenn is an amazing person. So for fun, what Glenn likes to do is climb up mountains wearing squirrel suits that have these kinds of um, connections between the body and the arm and jump off um, cliffs. And he's done this in the Himalayas. So he's climbed the Indian Himalayas. Um, in fact, I think he met his, for his, his wife doing this, this kind of thing. He helped her to overcome <laughs> her fear of heights by doing this. So again, some amazing people. Um, you can see some of the film crew here, here, Glenn. Um, it's interesting, uh, you, you know, you think going out to sea that the biggest people would be the people who are doing all the, the heavy lifting associated with the sub and the, the landers. The biggest people were the, the film crew that had to carry these 3D cameras everywhere. Large, massive cameras that usually are on, on, on tracks that they would climb up ladders and stand on containers on a rocking ship to, to do filming, so super people. And, and of course, during the morning meetings, Jim would run the, the, the meeting. He was a very strict taskmaster. He would go through all the different teams associated with various responsibilities, and you had to make sure that you had completed your task, or if you hadn't, um, you knew what the problem was, and you knew when it was going to be solved, um, so that everybody in the team could, could figure out just what the, the time frame was going to be for, for getting the sub and the landers operational and in sync. Okay, so what about the, the operations? So here's a, a view of the deployment of this, this beautiful green machine um, in the New Britain Trench. Uh, this, we started off with just a shallow water dive. We went from one kilometers to four to, to eight kilometers. So here, here it is with Jim, Jim inside. Um, uh, and during deployment and recovery, I wanted to highlight, there were a number of divers who would be involved with getting uh, floats off or on the submersible and with other aspects of the recovery. And this is a, not a good picture, but this is Charlie Arneson. Charlie was a graduate student here at, at Scripps. Phenomenal marine ecologist, has written books on invertebrates in the Western Pacific, guide, guide books, and uh, actually ran the film studio for the filming of the Titanic in, in Baja, California. And just a great guy. You'd see him out there doing all this diving work. And then when the sub was back on deck, he was back on deck filming um, s some of the operations associated with, the re uh, um, w with Jim and the, and the interviews and so on. So uh, he took care of much of the logistics as well. And here's Jim coming out of the sub. During the first sub, many of us associated with the expedition all had our our cameras out and our iPhones and whatnot, and we were all taking pictures. We were all so excited. Everything worked, and, and, and the deployment recovery was fine. So we were all excited about that. And afterwards, we got the message from Jim and the film crew that it really didn't look very professional for most of the people on the ship to be um, taking pictures, uh, was, especially when we had professionals to do that sort of thing. So <laughs> then we put our iPhones away, and, and we were a little bit more restrained. But it was, this was a, 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 great, a great evening to, to see Jim come back, and, and he, was, he was certainly excited. One of the things that happened shortly after Jim got back on, on the ship and, and, and after a, a, a little bit of time was he started looking over the sub videos and seeing what, uh, what they had actually filmed, what he had actually filmed. And off the cafeteria, off the mess hall, there was a area for reading and for working on the computer, and there was a, a TV monitor there. And we could see Jim, by looking at that monitor, doing the editing, going through the, the filming. I, I just took my 35 millimeter camera, took a, a screenshot of, of just what he was doing, because it, even though it's a terrible image, it shows a little bit of the magic of what it was like. This is just one kilometer, so it's not super deep, but it's just amazing to see this vertical submarine, and you see the, um, uh, uh, the boom coming out there, and you've got it right up against the, the lander, closer than uh, any UNOLS associated sub would ever be allowed to, to get to a device that has implodable glass spheres in, inside it. But, um, but there he is right, right there, um, 
And the two juxtaposed to one another, very dramatic. Uh, it's almost like looking at, at, at a moonshot, right? Um, it's just, just surreal. And the way Jim was doing the editing, the, this, the screen was split. So you see these, these um, partial dual images. And it was just very exciting to, to see everything that was going on. The lander had some baited traps associated with that. And that's what's on the sea floor. And, and Jim's coming very close just to, to get some film of, of that. So um, from that point on, everybody was enthralled with a kind of imagery that could be generated. Um, this, this is uh, a video that shows a, a shallow water dive. And I think it's nice because it shows some selected images of the sub looking at the lander. Um, and, it's, and it's shallow water. Um, and, and this is with a different pilot. This is Ron Allum inside. Um, but I think it's nice to see the sub uh, juxtaposed to the lander and then the, the lander close to the sub. They could film one another. Um, and there's an eel. Uh, this, this was a, 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 f a film period where we, we saw a fair amount of life there. Okay, and then conversely, this is the lander filming the sub. And you see more of the eels out there. Um, and uh, you see a little, little bit of, of the sub. It's not a particularly clear view, but you can, you can get an idea of how the two instruments could be used um, to, to film one another and to, to, uh, to create on the mermaid sapphire. And there were really stunning images of the, the ROV going around both the lander and the sub, filming them together. And, and that was really beautiful. Um, okay, so here's, here's a subsequent dive in the New Britain Trench. And I don't want you to so much focus on the deep sea octopus. Um, this, th th look at the sea floor. Life is everywhere there. Um, we saw my marine biologist colleagues, Peter Batts and Erica Montague, describe this as acorn uh, worm burrows. There were also these rosette structures that uh, they indicate were made by, by spoon worms. Those of you who are invertebrate biologists may, able, may be able to um, to, to verify that, but it was just striking how the evidence of, of uh, invertebrate life, benthic invertebrate life, was everywhere in this very productive environment. Within the New Britain Trench, even at eight kilometers, uh, we saw uh, coconut uh, fronds uh, and leaves. It was a very productive environment. Uh, I, we, we, we collected samples for chemistry. We don't have those results yet, but I think that'll verify just how, how nutrient rich it was. And then after the four kilometer dive came the eight kilometer plus dive, actually 8.2 kilometers. And this is just showing you the bottom time that Jim had. Uh, this is the dive that made the Deep Sea Challenger the, the deepest diving man sub ever uh, at 8.2 kilometers. Um, and there was also some, some, some wonderful deep sea life to, to explore. So what did Jim see when he was there? Here, here you can actually see the 3D camera looking back uh, at the, the epic camera, uh, the porthole, if, if you will. Um, um, and so he, here he is. You can see some sediment's been kicked up, and uh, not just sediment, but you see a, a, a jellyfish there. Uh, again, 8.2 kilometers, very deep. Um, we also saw at eight kilometers a variety of acorn worms. These are hemichordates. They're studied by Nick Holland here at Scripps and Karen Osborne, former uh, postdoc of Greg uh, um, uh, Rouse's, also has been collaborating in this study. We saw a number of them. I think on the eight kilometer dive, there were five, six acorn worms uh, that, that were seen. Um, also, with the macro lens, there was some stunning imagery that could be obtained. So here we have some stalk sea anemones. This is coming up the trench wall from 8.2 kilometers. And you get a feel for just the kind of close-up imagery that Jim was able to get of, of these sea anemones. Just, just beautiful to see them, the, 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 the hanging flowers of the New Britain Trench, if you will, the hanging gardens. Um, but, but, but very nice to be able to see with that kind of detail. We also, whoops, 
We also were able to use the landers at this depth, at the 8.2 kilometers, to collect some samples with our baited traps, with our, um, well, with our, with our chicken bait in, in this case. And um, so here you see one of the 5D images from the lander looking at the, uh, we, have, we have a fish trap and then we, you see the water sampler and there's also um, a baited trap there. And uh, what you're looking at are enormous, they've been characterized as super giant amphipods. Amphipods which are usually one or two centimeters in size. Inside the trap they were up to 17 centimeters. This guy's about 30 centimeters in length. Just enormous amphipods. And um, it turns out that these are the deepest members of these super giant amphipods ever seen. And a month or so before this trip was the very first example of finding these giant amphipods in a trench. It was in the Kermadec Trench, um, and it was a cruise by Alan Jameson from the, uh, from the Ocean Lab in, in Aberdeen. So this was really striking to see these kinds of images and to get this kind of, uh, of video as well. Here's the catch uh, coming back up on board the, the mermaid sapphire. Um, and, uh, and everybody was interested uh, in, the, in these, these large creatures. So Jim and, and Ron looking at what we've, we've just been able to recover. Oh, gee. I don't think we need that, do we? <laughs> so, so there was a lot of interest in, the, in these big guys and, and a lot of questions about how such organisms can see at such great depth. They all have these very, um, very uh, dramatic looking yellow eyes. Um, and, and we had a pretty good haul. Here you can see some of that. Um, and as a public service announcement, let me just say, if, if any of you have ever considered burial at sea, this is what, what happened to our chicken. So here's one. <laughs> Here's, here's a chicken leg that we put down in, in the Niskin sampler, and this is what this, these guys did to it. And then we had a whole chicken in the, the fish trap, a whole entire chicken um, um, uh, attached, and, and this is what we got back from that. So uh, keep that in, in, in mind. Um, <laughs> It was great to be on a cruise with all these people who were really good at filming and, <laughs> and Photoshop. <laughs> so they were, they were big, but okay, they weren't that big. <laughs> okay, so um, things, things went well. During the New Britain part of the trench, we were able to collect some things. We didn't collect a lot. Um, and it, from the shallow water depths, some of my colleagues were able to use some of their macro lenses and photographic skills to, to look at uh, in a little more in detail at what we got. This happens to be an isopod here. So we, so we do have some of that. We have some pickled samples that are, are coming back uh, here by, by a slow boat. Um, while we were doing all this work off the, the, the New Britain Trench, we also had an opportunity to come to shore um, sometimes. Uh, one day I, I, I was on shore testing some equipment and speaking to the head man of a, a village, and a helicopter appeared, and associated with the helicopter was um, uh, Jason Carroll from CNN. And we were all on the, on the ship, we were really interested to, to see Jason because for several days before he actually arrived, CNN had been broadcasting that he was on the ship. And even though that, <laughs> that ship is pretty big, we were pretty sure he wasn't there yet. <laughs> so it was, it was good to finally, finally meet him and, and the, he did a, a good story on, on the cruise. But at, from, from, really it was from this point on, that our, our relative tranquility uh, ended because then the public became aware of what was going on with Deep Sea Challenger and uh, there was a lot more news going, going on. Um, but it was great to, to go to shore sometimes. Uh, Jim had a, a chance to go to shore in, 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 you can see in this image, he's on an um, outrigger canoe with a, a little boy and it was really a great scene. He was rowing in one direction, the little guy was going the other direction, and they weren't making any headway, and finally Jim graciously let him, let him have his way. <laughs> uh, 
But it was great to be able to spend a little time on, on land. Uh, there was an opportunity later on to uh, go into the highlands and see uh, a binding uh, fire dance, and that was really exciting to see. A number of, of the scientists here at Scripps have gone to Papua New Guinea for various kinds of collection and, and exploration. Um, Ray Weiss, in a former life, when he was a physical oceanographer, spent time there. Um, others now, have, in more recent years, have, have gone there. Beautiful place to, to do science. I, I hardly recommend it. Um, it was fun um, that same day when there was the filming with Jim and the Outrigger Canoe. Um, we met these kids coming home from school. And I don't think this would translate well over here, but uh, many of them had machetes in their, in their hands. Um, and I guess if you live in a tropical environment, that's just part of, part of life. But a great group of kids to, to meet. <laughs> okay, so I want to transition from Papua New Guinea now to um, Micronesia and Guam and, uh, and the Challenger Deep. So at this point, we're all very excited the system is working. Uh, people have to work very hard. The engineers have to work tirelessly to keep that sub operational, to take care of all of the components, uh, the hydraulics and electronics and so on. But it's working, and so um, we, we're certainly pumped up. Um, and so from there, we head on to, um, to the northern part of the Western Pacific Ocean. I had the pleasure of being able to fly uh, from Rabaul to Port Moresby to, 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 to Cairns and, and up to Guam. Uh, others took that passage across the equator and uh, the ritual associated with that passage. Um, and in this case, you know, I haven't really mentioned um, everybody that was participating in the cruise, but uh, it was a, a wonderful collaboration between Australian uh, scientists and engineers and American scientists and engineers. Much of the technical crew on the Mermaid Sapphire were from Scotland, so um, we had all different languages, all different versions of the English language being, being spoken, which was um, sometimes problematic. Uh, for example, when it had to do with metric versus uh, feet conversions, which uh, Jim tended to insist upon. Um, and during this rite of passage, I know there was a lot of Vegemite involved. I don't know exactly the details, um, and it must be an Australian thing. Uh, <laughs> so that's where we're heading to, and, 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 and you all know the, the Challenger Deep, the deepest uh, spot on Earth, or maybe I should say spots. It's um, 10 by 40 kilometers or so in, in, in size. You know it's... it's the Challenge Deep is, is deeper than Mount Everest is high. Um, uh, it's uh, deeper than commercial airliners uh, fly uh, as, as well. Um, so quite a, quite a place to, to head out to. It's also the site of one of our more recent national monuments. And as Stuart Sand and others here at Scripps could tell you more than I, we have all this, this new real estate in the marine environment that's protected, that's a national monument. The Mariana Trench Marine National Monument is um, a largely unexplored environment, but one that I'm sure if we could explore more, we would, as a country, cherish it as we cherish the Grand Canyon and Yosemite, but it's, it's largely unknown at, at this point. Some parts of this national monument, there's also an islands region, um, uh, are just amazing. There, there are all these hydrothermal vent environments in um, the Back Arc Basin and the Four Arc Basin of, of this region, some with liquid CO2, some with liquid sulfur, just amazing places to, to go to. And again, some script scientists are involved with, with some work there. We went to this spot here on our return, it's now named the Serena Deep, named for, uh, by some school kids in, in Guam, which was kind of neat. So uh, Serena Deep, named after a, a, a Philippine mermaid. Um, and then the Challenger Deep is in the uh, waters of the Federated States of Micronesia. So we needed two separate sets of uh, permits for the, the work that we did there. Um, when we we're doing the work in the Mariana Trench, our home base for science and for logistics and for, for lander uh, setup was the Marine Laboratory at the University of Guam. People there, wonderful, wonderful colleagues. We now have a memorandum of understanding with the University of Guam. We hope to have some undergraduates here this summer and uh, we hope to keep that relationship going for, for a very long time. 
Um, at, the, at the marine lab, they do have some uh, guest facilities. And uh, this is a picture with someone from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, but also some uh, additional people from the science team. This is Patty Fryer from the University of Hawaii, a geologist who's done a lot of bathymetry. Um, I'm sure knows of, of, of Bob Fisher uh, very well, um, but has, has worked in the Mariana Trench for, for many, many years. And this over here is Kevin Hand, an astrobiologist from the Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, was very interested in, in collecting forams and doing some spectroscopy on their or organic uh, cell walls. Two, two super people to have as, as colleagues. And this is a, a, a picture of the boat that we worked off of for lander operations in the Mariana Trench. It was an Indonesian oil survey uh, vessel. And I want to highlight uh, Christina here, Christina Massel Simons, a former Scripps graduate student, worked with Peter Lonsdale for her PhD research, and she also was there to, to help with some of the geological considerations and, and was a, a super colleague to have. Okay, so um, we stayed in Guam for, for a while. We had to get um, uh, set up for the, the, the big drop for some of the the facets of the expedition. There were people who were getting off and other people who were coming on the Mermaid Sapphire. We had a number of deep sea dignitaries who joined us. Don Walsh, who was, uh, is the only living um, pilot from the Bathyscaphe Trieste, uh, was here, was, was a part of th this expedition. Um, uh, uh, Anatoly Sergev was there, the, the designer of the Mir submersibles. Um, Chris Welsh, associated with Virgin Oceanic, was, was there. So, uh, and, and additional f uh, people from the, the media were there as well. So we were there for, for a while, and when everything was set up, we, we, we headed out to the Challenger Deep. This is a, a picture taken by Joe McGinnis, wonderful writer, um, has had some amazing life experiences himself. But this is a, here's a picture of Joe's of the Challenger Deep. Uh, it was around the time we first did the unmanned sub dive there. So first the sub was used in an unmanned configuration and then, and then manned. Uh, beautiful day at sea. It was actually quite rugged by the time they deployed the and it was just an incredible rodeo to get that thing in the water. It was in, then it was out, and had to wait and, and, and then redeploy. Um, but here's the big dive. Here's the, the dive on March 26. And so um, here you can see, uh, looking up towards the surface, I think Jim must have had some amazing views of, of uh, when he was coming up after a deep dive, of seeing the this, this shimmering uh, sunlight, or in some cases, perhaps moonlight. Um, uh, I didn't hear any reports of bioluminescence. Here the divers are just releasing uh, some of the, the, the floats. And then, of course, um, I won't, I, I won't have sound for you, but this is touchdown here. So this is uh, the lander coming down. Uh, this is the east pond, so the eastern section of the Challenger Deep, the same place where the Kaiko, the, the Japanese ROV, has, has landed, and uh, the same place where um, the Nereus, the, the hybrid ROV uh, from uh, Hui, has, has gone before. So, so, so there he is. He's, he's, he's made it down. Uh, to full ocean depth, very uh, exciting. Um, I don't know if any of you can notice something peculiar about the manipulator arm. There's actually a few things peculiar about that. Um, anybody see anything funny? Very hard to, to see in this light. It'll, it'll come up a little bit more later. There it's a little more obvious. Um, the manipulator arm is wearing a watch. Uh, do, do you see that? It's actually a Rolex watch. <laughs> Rolex is, was one of the sponsors of the expedition. Actually, this is a good opportunity for me to, to let you know it was Rolex and National Geographic and Sloan Foundation and, and Jim himself. Um, I don't know who would want a watch that could do something like this, but uh, if you do, Rolex. Remember Rolex. And so I just wanted to show you this, not so much because of Rolex, but uh, this is a very special scene for me. Um, the payload door has been opened, and Jim has just pushed down and gotten a sediment sample for me. And, uh, and, uh, and again, I'm indebted to the folks who helped to make this happen. Uh, Bruce Sutphin also helped out. Bruce is here in the, in the audience, a uh, great physicist and uh, somebody who's worked with uh, America's Cup and, and the Navy before. 
So not a whole lot of sediment. It was 50 mils of, of, of sediment with seawater that was obtained. So very, very little, but it was recovered and we've, we've processed it for the kinds of microbiology and genomics and chemistry that, that we do. So we were thrilled about that. Um, so what did, what did Jim see during this part of the dive? Now this is 11 kilometers or so down, deepest spot on Earth. What was there to see? It was a, the sediment, as in the New Britain Trench, was a, a, a light, uh, silky sediment, easily stirred up. Um, but there wasn't much in the way of life to see. Certainly, you couldn't see uh, any, any obvious signs of organics um, there. But curiously, there was on the seafloor this kind of metallic looking box there. And I don't know if any of you can identify it. When Jim first sat down, it looked like he could follow the tracks of another another device, and, I, and, and Patty's guess was that it, it's the track from the Nereus, um, or excuse me, from the Kaiko, uh, the Japanese ROV. And um, so I wonder, and I'll have to talk to some of my Japanese friends if that, that could be something that was left there. It just doesn't look like um, some, some uh, human refuse. I, th I think this must be something associated with, with the diving operation. I also want, want to highlight the sediment that you see on, on top here. I don't know what this is, and I'm hoping some of you can help me with it, if it's signs of bioturbation. Uh, in the past, with some lander operations in the Serena Deep, with Lisa Levin's uh, assistance, Lisa identified some forams, some foraminifera, xenophyophores. So I don't know if these could be something like that. But anyways, if you could help me with that, um, that would be great. Here's another, another image that Jim flew over with the submersible. And to me, this is fascinating. So the, the little box here is just a couple centimeters. This is maybe two meters long. Um, and I wonder if this couldn't be the remains of some carcass that fell down to the sea floor, was largely degraded. The darkness could be um, sulfur reduction, and so we're seeing iron sulfide deposits, but um, I could certainly be wrong about that. Here is the, the sub going over this, this environment. So please, for those of you who know, and, and this would be really appropriate to talk to Greg Rouse about, I think, um, uh, it would have been wonderful, of course, if we had been able to have obtained a, a sample there to, to look at. We didn't, um, but it is intriguing. So perhaps some, some signs of, of a life form that, that fell down to the Challenger Deep. Okay, and then the dive uh, shortly after was, was over. Here is just some movement of the sub along the, the north face. Um, again, it gives you some of the impression of the alien-like en environment that, that was there. Very little to, to, to see. Um, you don't see the, the worm trails or burrows or, or anything like that down there. We saw a few amphipods, small amphipods here and there, uh, and that was it. Looks like I, I should wrap things up here. I'm sorry I've gone so long. After, the, um, after that big dive, uh, Jim was taken away um, uh, on this boat here. Uh, this is the mega yacht, the octopus. Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, was good enough to give him a ride. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting hearing some of the radio communication amongst the ships during the, during the dive. Um, so the banter back and forth between the, uh, the Indonesian boat and, uh, and the Mermaid Sapphire all had to do with business. Um, in the case of the, the octopus, not not so much. Um, one of the crises they experienced was that they ran out of limes, and so we were hearing about this. <laughs> so life on the octopus was a little bit different. Maybe, maybe the margaritas were flowing, I don't know. Um, um, in terms of the science from this dive, so um, there, there is all the video data, which I think is invaluable, but also uh, some of the physical data. This is a slide from Lynn Talley. Lynn has a real interest in um, the adiabatic heating that goes on in trenches, which result in a slight increase in temperature, as you can see on, on this plot here, as you, as you go deep in these enclosed, very, very deep uh, trench environments. And so Lynn would like to look at the CTD data from the sub to, to look at that. Others are interested in, uh, in, in, in turbulence uh, in deep ocean environments. Jen McKinnon and um, Rob Pinkle are interested in looking at the data for that purpose. 
So there's the physical data as, as well. Um, after uh, the big dive, Jim had to leave for several days. Uh, we stayed in this beautiful atoll, um, the Ulithi Atoll, western end of, of Micronesia. Um, when, when Jim came back, we did some more shallow water work, but we didn't do another uh, deep ocean dive, and that will happen in the next phase of, of diving operations. So that's, that's going to happen. Um, but just in, in ending, let me say that Jim gave those of us who were involved with the lander operations uh, a wonderful presence. Even after the sub-operations were done, he allowed Kevin and, and Kevin, uh, Kevin Hardy's team to go off on, on that in, uh, Indonesian oil survey vessel and do a number of lander deployments in the Mariana Trench. So we were able to do some additional deployments, and those work just beautifully. This is the ship, um, the, the, the stern uh, of, of the ship. You can see with the A-frame and the winch, um, the cleats and whatnot. It was very well set up for deploying the, the landers. and. Um, in the, let me just uh, back up here. So you see these, these two containers here. So this was where the, um, um, the lander equipment was. This is where the, uh, um, the science operations were. So just to give you a sense of what went on, I haven't had a chance yet to mention Roger Chastain's name. So Roger Chastain is a technician who works with me, and he's the person who set up this lab here and, and did a beautiful job. So Roger was all set up for processing samples in various ways, for doing high pressure incubations and for processing material for genomic studies and, and so on. So uh, we had a good lab in, 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 um, in this container. It was air conditioned, so our samples didn't uh, get too hot and we didn't get too hot, so that was good. Um, and of course, the, one of the sweetest sights in working with landers is to, to see them coming up to the service. And Kevin worked it out beautifully. We're just off the port or just off the starboard side. The landers came up during our sequential deployments and worked beautifully. Um, here's a view from the middle pond of the Challenger Deep area, uh, an unexplored region. And we had no problem uh, collecting amphipods, smallish amphipods, but collecting amphipods. You see some of that here. Um, also, we went to the Serena Deep, so now we're in the Mariana Trench Marine National Monument. This is the, the lander arm coming down. You, you see the, the beta trap come into view and then crash. <laughs> there it is, coming on the sea floor. And we landed on this slope with all these beautiful rock formations there. And um, so let me give you a little better view of that. I'll, I'll wrap things up in a couple slides here. So you can see these, these beautiful rock formations there. Kevin Hand, the guy from the JPL, stitched together all these photos that were generated by the 5D camera and noticed something really striking. And, and, and that is that as he's down and is imaging the seafloor, sea he's very interested in rocks, especially rocks that can be associated with a process called serpentinization that generates hydrogen and methane energy sources that microbes can, can use. And as he was looking across these rocks, he noticed something that was really striking. And this is really just what I'll, I'll, I'll end with here. Um, so he, he noticed um, these really interesting formations on, on, on the rocks. And it could be the result of this process of serpentinization, could be abiotic, but it could, these could also be microbial mats on, on the sea floor, even at this great depth. This is pretty much uh, as deep as the Challenger Deep. This is 10.7 kilometers or greater. And so fascinating discovery made by Kevin Hand at the JPL. Okay, well, there's a lot to talk about. I've talked too long as it is. Um, if you do want any more information, the National Geographic has a wonderful website with lots of background information and lots more stories about some of these amazing engineers and, and, and writers and so on who are involved with the expedition. So um, please, please go there. And know that this isn't the, the end of the expedition, um, they'll, that, or the end of, of this kind of exploration. This submersible may be uh, uh, refitted for, for deep ocean work at some point in the future. Certainly at this point in, in the phase two of the operations, we're just analyzing lots of material for, for science. And so that's the, the main thrust of the project right now. Um, 
but there's there's lots more work to done to be done, and, and there's a lots more areas of these deep ocean trenches to explore. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so late. I'd be glad to take questions. Uh, yes. Uh-huh. There's the impression that there's a, a real difference in the form of it at the bottom of the Britain Trench and the American right. and it's the other worms and so on. And I was wondering uh, if you have any ideas on that. For example, could the uh, several thousand extra meters pressure difference be inhibiting you know, life at the bottom of the shelf? Yeah, I don't think it, that's what it is, Tony. I, th- I think it has to do with the nutrients. I think the New Britain Trench is just such an organically rich environment that it provides for, for a, a greater amount and, and um, perhaps diversity of, of life. But I think it has to do with the nutrients, not the pressure. My guess is that if we could put a, a few whale falls into the Challenger Deep, we'd start to see some, some things take off there, too. <laughs> Um, so I think that's the key. I don't think it's the, uh, the temperature or the, the pressure. Um, I, th- I think it has to do with just the or- organics that are there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, thank you all for coming. Mm-hmm.